One mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here is end time newsman, Rick Wiles. Commodities investor Jim Rogers will join me in the second half of today's program. There was another Islamic terrorist attack today targeting Christians. This time, it was Australia. A van loaded with gas cylinders exploded after being driven into a building in Canberra. The targeted building is the headquarters of the Australian Christian Lobby. It was destroyed, and the two-story office building named Eternity House was badly damaged by fire. German law enforcement officials are searching for a Tunisian asylum seeker in connection with the Christmas market massacre in Berlin. Angry German protesters gathered outside Angela Merkel's office demanding her resignation. In France, conservative populist Marion Le Pen warned that Islam is a global threat and that European leaders act like they're powerless to combat it. Ms. Le Pen is considered the leading candidate for president in France's 2017 election. She called today for a global coalition to fight against Islamism. Ms. Le Pen blamed Angela Merkel for the Berlin attacks. In a press conference, she said, quote, How many more people must die at the hands of Islamic extremists before our governments close our porous borders and stop taking in thousands of illegal immigrants? I call for the immediate restoration of national borders and equally the immediate cessation of the distribution of migrants in our communities, end of quote. In the USA, President-elect Donald Trump doubled down on his comments yesterday that Muslim terrorists are targeting Christians. We have a soundbite of Mr. Trump. All along, it's been proven to be right, 100% correct. What's happening is disgraceful. Anyway, make sure everything's fine, folks. Nice to have you here. Have you talked to President Obama at all, sir? I have not. Two days ago, but not recently. Not since. Um, Your your comments about the uh, shock attack in Berlin being against Christians, do you think that this might... um, Say it again, what? Your your the attack in Berlin being against an attack against Christians. Well, who said that? When did when was that said? I think I, be, I believe you said it in a press release. So, go ahead. so I'm wondering how this might affect relations with Muslims. It's an attack on humanity. That's what it is. It's an attack on humanity, and it's got to be stopped. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go again. The old, dying, left-wing news media, more upset that Donald Trump said that the terrorist attack was an attack against Christians. They're more upset about those comments than the attack on innocent people. Right. It's disgusting, Doc. The old, left-wing, dying news media, they can't bring them. There's two things that they can't say. They can't say radical Islam, and they can't say... Christian persecution. Right. They can't bring it out. They can't admit that it's out there. Well, there is a revolt in the world against the left. It's it's happening in Europe. It, it's happening in Great Britain. It's already happened in America. I've waited for decades to see this come about. Uh, there's a really good chance that Miss Le Pen will be the president of France that Gert Wilders will be the Prime Minister of Holland. There is a revolt against the left. People are fed up with the insanity of the left. The left has brought Islam into Western culture. Islam didn't get here on their own. They didn't get here. The Islamists didn't get here without the help of the left. The left brought about this multiculturalism. And it's a grand failure. It's destroyed Great Britain. It's destroying Germany. It's destroyed Sweden. Right, and it's all under the guise of compassion. Yet you take off that mask of compassion, you have to really question what the motives are just to bring about change. Change brings conflict. Conflict brings opportunity for 
especially leftist powers, to take advantage of those the, times. The left always rules in chaos. Right. We were talking about multiculturalism 18 years ago on this program, that this was going to this was going to lead to chaos in society. And we are now at the chaos stage in, in many countries. And if, if Obama had not been stopped and, and the Clintonistas, had they not been stopped, we would have millions of Muslims being brought to this country over the next four years. Yes, because they also know about cycles. They also know about change taking place in the world. They thought they were that change, that they were riding that wave of change, and yet something's happened. There's been a change in the heavenly, so to speak. That's right. What else has happened today? Well, we've, uh, of course, there's more talk on the uh, uh, Berlin Christmas market attack, um, and apparently now they're looking out for a Tunisian that somehow came into Germany, this Tunisian at some point in the past, had been actually served time in Italy for arson. How do they know it's a Tunisian? The first guy that they uh, detained turned out to be the wrong guy. This, and the guy right. that they detained was a passenger in the truck. Right. And What I was get, he doing in the truck? That's, that's a good question, Pastor. Well, right now they're looking Was for he this. hitchhiking <laughs> to, to get picked up by the wrong truck driver? And they held him for 24 hours. And so, but apparently they found the ID the ID papers of the driver. At least they found some ID papers of someone in that truck. And so they're looking, of course. They're looking for this Tunisian man. And here's what they know about him. They know it's like they, they found the, the passports and the driver's license right. or whatever at, at, at the World Trade Center. Right. So they, um, uh, they know that he served time in Italy for arson. They know he used six different aliases. And apparently the German police have been looking for him for three years. So they knew all about him. Um, but he left his ID in the truck. truck. You're right. So, so as he was jumping out of the truck, he he threw his wallet in the in the seat. Now there's speculation out there that maybe he was injured in the crash, um, or whatever might happen. But I'll tell thing, you what my speculation is. He left misleading ID in the truck. I believe that to throw people off and have them chasing after the wrong person. Right. I mean, this is an old trick. Yeah, and they'll probably never find this guy, the Tunisian guy they're looking for. Uh, oh, he's, he's dead. Probably, yeah, he, he's already achieved room temperature somewhere. So, but this attack, of course, Pastor, it was a cold-blooded attack. This wasn't just an attack on on a market or anything like this. You got to remember, folks, this was in front of one of the ancient sites there in Berlin, one of the oldest churches, and it was bombed out during World War II, but it's still a respected site. This Christmas market probably been in operation for a couple hundred years at mm-hmm. least. This was not a random attack. It was it was not. a message. And so it was a cold blooded attack, Pastor. Nothing less. I thought it was interesting today that uh the London papers reported that Queen Elizabeth, who's ninety years old, and her husband, uh Philip, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, and he's ninety five. Right, um, that that they were, both of them had come down uh, with severe colds, and would not be taking the train uh, tomorrow as usual at Christmas time in in Great Britain uh, to their uh, country residence in Eastern England, uh, the uh, Sandringham Castle, and they. This is what they do every every year on uh, December 21st. They travel by train, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a it's, Christmas it's, tradition. It's a, yeah, it's a tradition in the royal family. So they announced today that the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh w- would not go because of the, they have bad colds. Now, it's very possible. The 90 and 95 years old, I mean, I'm myself, I'm dealing here with um, with a cold. But my first thought was mm. they're not sick. And I'm speculating. I mean, it's just totally I'm speculating. But my first thought was they're not sick. But MI5 told the queen, under no circumstances, your majesty, do you get on a train and travel right now? Right. I mean, can you imagine the train carrying the queen being blown up? And that's the world we live in now, right? Yes. 
that we actually have to we actually have to assume and speculate along those lines that you know in a normal world where jihadists aren't driving trucks into Christmas markets, we wouldn't even think of things like that. Well, the comment that I read yesterday, and I still don't know who made the comment that uh, all of these uh, things are being hatched in inspired in Britain. Um, I mean, there are there are people right now who are pointing towards Great Britain, saying it's the British government that's it has its hands in a lot of these things. So the Queen would be a target. But I don't think it's a. I'm not surprised that that the Queen is staying put in. Buckingham Palace this Christmas. It would be very dangerous uh, for her to be traveling in a train at, at this time of the year, and and I, I think security is probably tight everywhere. In fact, did you did you all see the story out of New York? It was a uh, kind of a neighborhood New York neighborhood publication. Uh, what's it called? NDA or something like that? NDA.com, and it it was why the uh, the uh, military plane was circling Manhattan. Ooh, okay. So what reason? Because was uh, there's some no-fly zone. You can't, you can't right. be flying around in there. Okay. Uh, yes, dnainfo.com. Mysterious Manhattan military flyover was Trump rescue exercise. The uh, website said, a military airplane and two huge helicopters doing loops over Midtown last week were conducting an emergency relocation planning mission in case they need needed to extract President-elect Donald Trump during an emergency or attack. The site of the C-130 search and rescue aircraft and two um, helicopters making passes over the heart of the no-fly Manhattan for 40 minutes Tuesday without warning or explanation unnerved countless New Yorkers many of whom took to Twitter and Facebook to express post-9-11 concerns. Sources told DNAinfo.com that the flyovers were part of of an emergency relocation drill designed to identify locations, primarily in Central Park, where a chopper could touch down near Trump's home inside Trump Tower on 5th Avenue and 56th Street, safely evacuate Trump and others from the city. One source said the military is doing their homework. They're making plans how to remove him, mapping plans and strategizing. In the event of an emergency, the president would be whisked by the Secret Service north to the park and then flown by in a helicopter to the nation's capital or a secret government site. So why was there a C-130? Well, if I, for, for the military <laughs> that, background, that, that I can That sort say, of fits all that, but okay. there's a C-130 flying around, too. What, Edward, you're... Well, the, the C-130 has many variants. You can have a gunship, or you can also have the surveillance variant of the C-130. So, dual purpose here, the C-130 could act as, again, a, a master plane in the sky to give eyes to what's happening on the ground and in the streets. Now, what wasn't mentioned in that DNA article is also a Black Hawk chopper can land on top of Trump Tower or do, again, a pickup. See, so we have to remember, when he's in New York, the majority of his time is at the top level of Trump Tower. So the, the pickup in the park would be if he was, again, at an event or at something like a dinner, at, uh, which would be at ground level in Manhattan. Uh, the article said that the military gave um, New York Police Department a uh, very short notice about the flyover and uh, did not tell them about the C-130. So is this uh, is this the military just uh, getting ready, saying, "Hey, we got to from now on. We've you know, Donald, the president's going to be in New York City a lot. We got to get used to this." Or, or is the military are they are they alarmed that something very serious uh, could happen to Donald Trump in the very near future around Christmas time? Well, I think this is this is behest of uh, his national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Because, you know, I, I've spoken to the Secret Service spokesman, and, and also we've heard out of, out of the Trump camp that unprecedented levels of threats have been done and given to the Trump camp. Uh, and again, especially because of Donald Trump's move to ban Muslims or to, to mitigate the influx of radical Islam into the United States. Hey, going back to the assassination of the 
uh, Russian ambassador in Turkey this week. Turkish newspapers reported today that the assassin served on the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan's security detail. It's starting to stink, isn't it? Yeah. Really starting to stink. So, according to this, he wasn't just a a rogue cop or, you know, certainly wasn't a uh, Syrian rebel. No, he had to be specially trained to serve with the prime minister. That's right. And that's, is that, does that explain why he was able to get past um, the security checkpoint and didn't have to go through the metal scanner carrying his gun because everybody recognized him as a, basically a, a Turkish secret service agent. Well, I think it definitely, we already knew that he was uh, part of the Turkish police special forces, but this latest development, it may have a tie into again, the coup that happened in uh, July could possibly, he have been one of the people that was working from the inside or for an other organization, whether it be from outside the country or. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion in Turkey about why he was shot dead and not captured alive. Sure. Well, I read yesterday that he actually climbed the second floor of that building. Again, this, this again shows this man has some training. He physically climbed to the second level of that building and then was in a 15 minute gunfight with the Turkish special forces. I understand that, well, you know, yesterday, uh, for two days now, we've, we have um, stated that our, our belief, at least my belief, I don't put you guys on the line here with me, but it's my belief that, that uh, Obama's fingers are in this murder. Uh, he's got a motive. He, he made a threat. He, he uh, openly, publicly threatened last Friday to hit at Russia. And uh, three days later, two Russian diplomats were dead. And I think you have to take this uh, very seriously, that, that there's a motive behind uh, the assassinations. I understand that this actually was brought up to the White House press secretary, Josh Ernst. No, it was to John Kirby. Oh, Kirby at the State Department. Right. Yes. Okay. So, so somebody asked John Kirby at the U.S. State Department, uh, did the U.S. have a hand in the assassination of the Russian diplomats? Yes, this actually began with a, a call between John Kerry and Turkey's foreign minister. And during the call, Turkey's foreign minister said to John Kerry, both Turkey and Russia know the Gulenus terror cult was behind Russian envoy Karloff's assassination. Now, we actually have a clip of, uh, of what John Kirby responded to this question in a briefing last night at the uh, at the White House. The uh, uh, Turkish foreign ministry is saying that the foreign minister in his phone call today with Secretary Kerry said that Turkey and Russia knew that Gulenists were behind the assassination of the Russian ambassador. Uh, do you have a readout on that particular aspect and what is the U.S. response? We'll, we'll be issuing those? a readout of the of the phone call a little bit more detailed uh, later. Um, uh, I don't, I don't have anything specific with respect to that issue. I will tell you, though, uh, that the secretary, in his conversation with the foreign minister, did raise uh, uh, his concerns uh, about some of the rhetoric coming out of Turkey uh, with respect to um, uh, American involvement uh, slash support, uh, tacit or otherwise, uh, for this uh, unspeakable assassination yesterday because of the presence of uh, Mr. Gulen here in the United States. Um, and it is a, it's a, a ludicrous claim, absolutely false. There's no basis of truth in it whatsoever. And the secretary made that very clear in his discussions uh, today with the foreign minister. Well, what about the aspect of Gulen followers being involved? In I think the there's an active investigation going on, Steve, and, and, and I'm not going to get ahead of that. I don't um, I don't know, and I don't think you know, what the motivations were uh, behind this individual. I mean, I s saw, just like you saw, what he was shouting and, and, and screaming um, after he shot the ambassador. But we need, the, we need to let the investigators 
uh, do their job, that we need to let them, you know, uh, let the facts and the evidence take them where it is before we jump to conclusions. But any notion that the United States was in any way supportive of this or behind this or uh, even indirectly involved is um, absolutely uh, ridiculous. <laughs> So they're not going to admit to it, are they? They didn't deny it. They didn't deny it. That's he just said, the he said the, the claim is ridiculous, but he never denied it. He never not said once. absolutely no. We had no involvement in the murders. But Gullen, who yeah. is living in the United States in Pennsylvania, is a CIA asset. Right. And notice how they worded that and said, now, now we have an active investigation going on. And you know, maybe Gulen's involved in it. You know, who knows? I mean, we, we mm -hmm. don't know. There's an active, but of course we're not. It's ridiculous for you people to even ask this question. You know, and we were talking about Gulen earlier this year. Edward, we, you know, you were looking into his, he has a network of Turkish Islamic charter schools in the United States. Right. I would you know, just remind our True News audience, if you think back earlier this year, we were talking about Gulen and the charter schools. If I remember right, Edward uh, traced out how this is a major fundraising arm for the entire Gulenist movement. I mean, that's how they get their money to do the things that they've been doing here in the United States and around the world. Yeah, the money actually tied directly to Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And we're not talking about millions. We're talking about billions of dollars was involved in this. Listen to the statement out of the Kremlin. I'm reading from TASS. You know, we are Russian news source here. Thanks, comrades. According to the Washington Post, and prop or not, we are a uh, fake news site that peddles Russian news. So we're going to read from the TASS news agency right now. The moment of the murder of Russian ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, was not chosen accidentally. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said in an interview, Quote, of course, those who stand behind these killers did not choose the moment accidentally, the presidential spokesman said. According to Peskov, judging by all appearances, the provocation, quote, was prepared and carried out in a completely barbaric way. This is an unprecedented case in the entire history of our bilateral relations. This is the case which has been unanimously condemned in the world, and actually all the states have come up with very tough statements denouncing this barbaric act. Uh, according to Peskov, uh, Russian President Putin called the crime an act aimed at disrupting the normalization of Russian-Turkish relations and at undermining the efforts of Russia and Turkey to come closer to each other on the issue of settling the Syrian conflict. Now, this is what this is all about. This is a last-ditch effort to save Obama's war in Syria. Right. Obama got his butt kicked in Syria by Putin. And his legacy is smeared with blood. It's covered with blood. Right. Hundreds of thousands of people, mostly Christians, died because of Obama's war in Syria. That will never be changed. I don't care how they try to erase history. History books will record Obama destroyed Syria. And so Obama's down to three or four weeks. And uh, he's, he's acting like a lunatic trying to derail Putin from uh, finalizing, um, you know, some type of settlement in in Syria. The, but you got to take it a step further. Turkey is a NATO member. Right. And I think Karlov, the, the ambassador um, that was murdered, Karlov played a major role in wooing Erdogan away from NATO into the Russian sphere of influence. That's why Putin called him a genius. Maybe it was the possible intervention that Karloff had in stopping Erdogan from uh, dying in the coup in his country. You remember back to the F-16 that mysteriously 
could not yes. uh, get a, a, a targeting location on his uh, on his passenger jet while it was in air. That has still not been explained. But no. that's true. Hey, do you remember? Um, yeah, we're coming up on on New Year's Day. Last year, New Year's Eve in Europe. Remember what happened? The the mass sexual assaults and rapes. Oh yes, yeah. In, in Germany, yes, and also in Austria, mainly in Germany. In Cologne, yes, in Cologne, by the Muslims. All these Muslim men that were brought into the country by Merkel, they they raped and sexually assaulted German women who were in the streets celebrating the uh, New Year's. And um, the German government and the news media in Germany tried to cover it up. Right. But you know, because of social media and alternative media, the truth got out. Well, guess what? Austria's. Austria's government has a solution. Wait to hear what they're going to do to, to combat this problem with Muslim men raping uh, Aust- Austrian women. The Austrian police will hand out 6,000 rape alarms on New Year's Eve. I, you just, I'm, this is for real. They're going to, these are pocket rape alarms. They're going to be given to women uh, in Austria on New Year's Eve to help fight mass sex attacks, such as those perpetrated by migrants in Germany a year ago. The Interior Ministry said Austrian police officers will be distributing the devices um, in the coming week and run up to celebrations in Vienna. Uh, ministry spokesman Carl Heinz uh, Grunbuck said it's a national campaign aimed primarily at women on New Year's Eve. When activated, the rape alarm will emit a shrill sound aimed at deterring attackers and attracting help. So are they going to combine that with their strategy last year of putting out ads and saying, don't rape our women? Remember that? Well, yeah, I'm sure they're going to. They'll have the bus. Uh, they'll probably have the posters in the buses and the subway stations. And this is how the left thinks. Yeah, this is this is an example of of the mindless stupidity of the left. Oh, we'll we'll hand out rape alarms. How about hand out guns? <laughs> well, on that subject, Pastor, today the EU has actually announced a ban on semi-automatic rifles. The the, the very remnant of gun laws they did have, gun rights rather, in their country, uh, in their union, has been stripped from a uh, directive put out today by Brussels. Hey, one final story. Uh, because uh, Fior uh, Hernandez has a, a very important report coming up here before we take a break. We got Jim Rogers coming up here in just a few minutes. The governor of Virginia, mm-hmm. Terry McAuliffe, right. uh, who is... Uh, you know, a Clintonista with uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton. He is uh, recruiting a f- a Virginian resident, Edward, whom you have been to his home. Oh, Lord. Well, you weren't in his home. You drove around his home, okay, doing so- your investigation. He is recruiting this uh, Virginian citizen to run for office in the state of Virginia. Uh, we're talking about um, Kazir Kinky Lick Khan. And uh, now I want Governor McAuliffe to know that we know about Kinky Lick Khan. And, uh, you know, it will come out in the campaign. So, Governor McAuliffe, uh, I hope you have a way to explain it. And we have some other information about Mr. Khan's business activities that we will gladly bring out in the campaign. So you go ahead, Mr. McAuliffe, and you put that Muslim up for office in Virginia, and and True News will have its special reports as soon as he announces that he's running for office in in the state of Virginia. Um, A chilling video has surfaced depicting a man and a woman preparing 
their young daughters for jihad in Damascus, Syria. Disturbing. Reportedly, the video was recorded not long before a suicide bomb was detonated in a police department last week. Your Hernandez takes us through a report of this disturbing video. Be advised, it is disturbing. The solemn voice of a man behind a camera, believed to be the father of two beautiful girls about seven and eight years of age. He is filming them as a burqa-clad woman, in other words, in full Muslim garb, hugs and kisses them repeatedly. She is believed to be their mother. The online news publication Daily Mail released a detailed report on this disturbing video. The translation of part of what was being said brings anyone listening to a standstill. This video shows the last kiss she gave her seven-year-old child, one many would consider a kiss of betrayal. She was sending off these girls to jihad in Syria's capital, Damascus, reportedly on December 16. The man asked the woman if there was anything she would say to all Muslims. She replies, be patient, there's nothing else to do. He follows up with asking why she would send her young children to jihad. She replies that no one is young when it comes to jihad, as every Muslim is supposed to participate in jihad. After the man is heard praying to Allah to accept her sacrifice, the children utter the words, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater, they said in unison. Although recognized by many Muslims as a call to prayer, it is also a call to war for radical Islamic groups. Allahu Akbar. They are the words we have heard uttered repeatedly before, during, and even after recent attacks. Come on, girls, go fight and give your lives to Allah. This ominous character they trusted as their father continued to encourage. Syrian journalists confirmed to Daily Mail that the video depicts parents and their two girls. They also linked the younger child to the explosion at a police station in Damascus that injured three officers. Perhaps the detail considered most demonic and evil is that according to local media reports in Syria, the seven-year-old walked into the police station calmly, appearing lost, and asked to use the bathroom. She had a bomb somehow attached to a belt. That belt was detonated from afar. So it appears she didn't do it herself. Who could have activated that explosive? Who would use a child this way? In a separate video release, the same man believed to be the father of the girls appears with one on each side of him and asks the youngest what she was going to do today. The child replied, going to carry out a suicide bombing in Damascus. The chilling brainwashing continued as this man assured them that there was no need to fear because they would be going to heaven. And again, at the man's request, the girls responded. Well, let's take a break. Uh, When we come back, Investor Jim Rogers will be here to talk about uh, his perspective on how things are changing in the global economy now that Donald Trump will be going to the White House. You want to hear what Jim Rogers has to say. You're listening to True News. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. Does God hear everyone who prays? The answer might surprise you. Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. Now you've got friends, no doubt, who say, Now look, I'm not a Christian, but I do pray and I know God hears my prayer. Then the Word of God lied. The Bible says that God does not hear those who are living in wickedness, disobedience before Him, those who've never trusted Him as their Savior. That is, you're lost you're not a believer. The Bible says God does not hear your prayer. You say, well, then why should I pray? When you pray the prayer of confession, repentance toward God, He will hear that. But He says He does not hear those who are living a wicked life. 
The Bible says also that our sins have separated us from Him. A person who is not a Christian is separated from God. They say, well, you know what? But I believe God loves me just like He loves everybody else. Correct. Loving you is one thing. Having a relationship with you is something totally different. Let God's love compel you to accept the forgiveness and eternal life only He can offer. Learn more about becoming a Christian when you visit us at intouch.org. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. Welcome back to segment two of True News. I'm Rick Wiles. The American voters chose a different path on November 8th than what the establishment experts proudly predicted and arrogantly took for granted would happen. More than WikiLeaks and Mrs. Clinton's email server, the thing that I will always remember about the election campaign was Russia's mass civil defense drills in October in preparation for nuclear war. In recent years, many of us have felt like steam was building up inside the USA like a boiler and it was ready to explode. All the problems this nation faced are still here, but for the first time in many years, many of us feel hope that we may find a way to get through at least some of these problems. I even think it's possible we could see the USA and Russia become allies instead of enemies. Mr. Jim Rogers is on the telephone to give us his perspective. He's a businessman, investor, financial commentator, and best-selling author. Some of his books include Street Smarts, Adventures on the Road, and In the Markets, A Gift to My Children, A Father's Lessons for Life and Investing. Mr. Rogers is chairman of Rogers Holdings and the founder of the Rogers International Commodity Index. Jim Rogers, welcome back to True News. I'm delighted to be here, Rick. Yes, sir. Nice to hear you again. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Things were looking dark in America in recent years. Did the USA dodge a bullet last month? Well, we will find you're going to ask that in five years. Um, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Trump has said some very exciting things, such as he's going to cut taxes, which is always great anywhere in the world. He says he's going to rebuild infrastructure, which is always great. Uh, The question is, where's the money coming from? Uh, partly, and, and also Mr. Trump has said, however, that he's going to have massive trade wars with many countries in the world. Now, trade wars have always led to bankruptcy and sometimes to real war. So we'll have to wait and see. At the moment, the market is ignoring the bad bad things he said and looking at the good things. You can ask, as I said, in five years, and we'll know. And Barack Obama escalated the national debt crisis to an extreme level. Can any president Get us out of the mess without a financial crisis. Well, Rick, throughout history, no country that's gotten itself into this situation has gotten out without a crisis or a semi-crisis. I don't know why America should be any different. One of the lessons of history is that very few people learn the lessons of history. And if they do know the lessons of history, they say, oh, we can ignore them or we can overcome them. Uh, So the lesson is that no one has ever solved this problem without a problem. And so I would suspect America will have eventually a gigantic problem as well. I don't particularly like saying that, Rick. I'm like you. I'm an American voter and taxpayer. And so we have to face facts. Yeah, and those facts are that currently the U.S. Treasury is paying bondholders approximately $250 billion per year in interest payments. But the Congressional Budget Office projects that figure will double to a half trillion dollars in four years. So that's, and that's assuming that the 10 year treasury uh, will pay out a 4.1% interest rates by 2019. If those rates go up even higher, um, that interest payment is going to be more than a half trillion. So no matter what Donald Trump does, uh, he's still going to be saddled down with interest payments twice as high as what we're paying under Obama. <laughs> said what I said. No country has gotten itself into this kind of situation, gets out without a crisis or a semi-crisis. Sure, if interest rates start going back, I mean, they have started going back up, and when they get back to normal levels or normal historical levels, the U.S. is it's impossible for us to pay our debts. 
Now, again, I don't like saying it, but we have to face facts. Mm-hmm. Interest rates right now are the lowest they've been in recorded history. Never in American in world history have interest rates been this low. And it's an anomaly. It's artificial, and we're all going to pay a, a serious price. Have you ever um, you ever read the book uh, The Fourth Turning? No, sorry, yeah. I don't know. Oh, you would you would love it, uh, Jim. Uh, written in in the '90s by two sociologists. In fact, I'm going to talk um, to to one of the co-authors here this week. Um, they studied uh, history, well, U.S. and and uh, Great Britain history for 500 years, and they found a pattern of um, of cycles in in the way generations behave. And they found that that there are four turnings, about 20, 22 years uh, in length. And the fourth turning is a crisis stage. And they predicted in their book, Fourth Turning Back in the 90s, that somewhere around the year 2008, America would enter their, its next fourth turning, which turned out to be uh, eerily uh, correct. And uh, so if, if, their, if their logic holds, we are moving into the crisis stage of the fourth turning. And the last fourth turning was World War II. Um, Civil War was a fourth turning. The um, American Revolution War was was a fourth turning. So, based it's just what you're saying, we're at a crisis stage, regardless of who's in the White House. Oh yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, Mother Teresa could be president. We still have the problem. Uh, the debt is the highest. You know, no country in world history has ever been as deep in debt as we are. We're there with artificially low interest rates. I know, and Mr. Trump has vowed that we're going to have trade wars. Trade wars have always led to uh, serious problems, bankruptcy, and often have led to real war. So the the, the facts are all in in place for something like that to happen. Uh, I would like to think there's some way we can avert it, but history doesn't show uh, it, history doesn't show any reason for us to be optimistic. Yeah, one one thing that bothers me about uh, Mr. Trump is you know he he likes to say that he loves debt. And uh, he suggested during the uh, campaign that he might reduce the national debt by persuading uh, creditors to accept something less than full payment. So, in other words, he's he wants to renegotiate the debt. How do you think that would go down with uh, bondholders? Well, I mean, if I were a bondholder, I would say no. Now, if, he, if he can figure out some way to force them to do it, but that's that's a crisis. That's a huge crisis, you know. The gigantic amounts of debt that are owned by insurance companies, endowments, trust funds, you know, they suddenly find out they don't have as much money as they thought they did. That's called a crisis. Well, it it, it definitely would nip in the bud any future borrowing because nobody would loan money to the U.S. No, of course not. Nobody's going to go and give a debt need more money. It's, it's another lesson of history. People stay away from people who don't honor their obligations. Uh, you, you mentioned um, the artificially low interest rates, and uh, they are starting to creep up. Um, do, do you expect the Fed to continue this this uh, increasing uh, the rates, or, or or is this a one time uh, increase for the foreseeable future? Well, Rick, I don't pay that much attention to the central banks uh, back around the world. They, history shows they really mainly follow the market. Everybody pays attention to the central banks because they act like they are control things. And sometimes they do, at least for short periods of time. But the market is already forcing interest rates up and has for several months now. And the market's going to force rates higher and higher. In the U.S., we had a bull market in bonds for 35 years, starting in 1981. Uh, and by the way, the previous bond, the bond cycle was also 35 years, coincidentally. The, the bear market in bonds started in 1946 and lasted till 81. And now we have another, in my view, another turning where the bull market is coming to an end and the rates will go higher and higher, no matter what the central banks do. The central banks can stop it for a while. As I said, they can have short-term power in the markets, but basically the markets are going to take interest rates higher and higher. In much of the world, interest rates are negative right now. That cannot last, Rick. It cannot last, and it won't last. So be prepared for higher interest rates everywhere. Uh, what about uh, crude? Have uh, have oil prices bottomed? 
Well, in my view, yes, we're in the process of making a, a complicated bottom. Someday we're going to look back and, and say, oh, in 2015, 16, 17, oil prices made their bottom, and then, then prices will be going higher and higher. The reserves, the known reserves of oil everywhere in the world have been declining for some time except for fracking. Well, fracking is no longer, a, you know, the promised land. People realize it's not a miracle. You have to make money at fracking, and many of them have been losing money. So the world is going to face more problems, more supply problems down the road. And if a crisis comes, especially if it's a military crisis, who knows how high the price for it. Speaking of military crisis, uh, what, what do you make of this this incident with China and and the drone? Well, I, I, I don't know it. I don't. I haven't paid as much attention to it as perhaps I should have. But it seems to me like you know, if China finds a drone in their in their water, they would take it up, just like if we found a drone in the Gulf of Mexico, we would take it up. Uh, that, that's all, basically. I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, any comments about uh, all the hoopla here in the United States regarding uh, the alleged Russian interference in the election? Well, it's getting more and more alleged because nobody can come up with any proof of it, as you well know. I mean, it sounds to me like it's the Democrats trying to blame somebody for their loss. You know, people like uh, you know Edward Snowden, the guy who found a lot of stuff, and as far as the other guy, they say is not. It's not the Russians, and they, they don't have any reason to mislead us about it. The Democrats certainly have a reason to mislead us, uh, but I, I would suspect it's not accurate. I'm not sure, uh, even if the Russians tried, or even if anybody tried, I'm not sure how effective they can be. There are 300 million Americans and lots and lots and lots of voters, unless some guy figured out a way to, to corrupt every voting machine in, the, in America. I don't see how much effect they could have. The really frightening thing, Jim, is that you've got you've got politicians and and uh, major newspapers not only here in the U.S. but in Great Britain, and they're they're openly talking about um, options available to Barack Obama to retaliate against Russia, including shutting down their power grid. I mean, this, to me, this is this is insanity. I can't believe these people are seriously talking about doing something like this. Well, you know as well as I do that if that happens, somebody's going to shut ours down. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tit for tat world if that sort of thing starts happening. And, and unfortunately, throughout history, that's how wars start. They start with small little things, and the next thing you know, each bureaucrat decides, well, I, I can't let them get away with that, so I got to do something worse. And the next thing you know, we're all wondering, how did we get into this situation? You go back to 1914, you know, when everybody had these tit-for-tats, and the next thing you know, the world was in this gigantic, mad, crazy war. They were all trying to figure out how to get out. First of all, they were trying to figure out how do we get into this war, and now how do we get out of it? But then millions of people got killed and billions of dollars got thrown out the window. It's happened many times before, unfortunately, Rick, and I hope it's not happening again, but it could be. You're right. A few people know that the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was in retaliation for U.S. economic sanctions on Japan. I, I know that very well. You know, America said, okay, we're no longer selling scrap iron and a few other things. Well, that would cause the Japanese economy to grind to a halt. So the Japanese said, well, we'll show you. I'm not defending either of the actions, but uh, you know the result. That's right. Jim, do you think it's, uh, do, do you expect um, President-elect Trump to reset America's relationship with Russia? Well, uh, Mr. Trump has said uh, often that he, he likes Mr. Putin and he approves of many things he's been doing. So when it became clear uh, that Mr. Trump was going to win, it certainly means, if he, if he means what he says, and unfortunately he's all, always said a lot of things, but one of the consistent things is he likes Mr. Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Putin, and I would suspect that therefore things are not going to get worse, and they might well get better with the Russians and the Americans. Now, I hope things get better with everybody. I, I'm very much against any kind of a war. No, no war has ever been any good for anybody except commodity producers. But So I, I hope that everybody gets, gets along and we all go down to the bar on Saturday night and drink beer and have a lot of fun. Hey, isn't it time to just to bury the Cold War and just move on and, and uh, forget about 
what happened decades ago and, and just forge new relationships and try to make this a better world. No, of course it is, Rick. I mean, nobody, especially if, if bad times come, then everybody says, why did we do that? How do we get in that situation? Well, I wish people would say it before the problems come. Because everybody would say, hey, let's all have fun together. Let's trade together. Let's all make a lot of money together instead of the, the alternative, which has never been good for anybody. Well, there must be somebody that wants to keep that animosity going between the U.S. and Russia. Who who are these interests, and what 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 is their stake in keeping Russia and the United States at each other at each other's throats? Well, I, I unfortunately, again, if you study history, you see it's often bureaucrats who are sitting there lusting for power or thinking they're doing some of them to be polite. Think they think they're doing the right thing or the right thing for their country, and often they're just misguided. If you look. Recently, what happened in Ukraine, you know, the recordings in the world knows that a, a bureaucrat, what's her name, Val, uh, Valerie Lundgren or something, a woman in, in the State Department said she wanted to get rid of the people running the Ukraine, and she organized a coup, did everything she could, uh, and was successful. She, she caused a, a big uh, turmoil in, in Ukraine, and now we're all paying for it. It's outrageous. It was an illegal coup organized by the State Department, and yet now now we're all at each other's throats. Right, yeah, you're talking about Victoria Nuland. Yeah, that's her name, Victoria yeah. Nuland. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. yeah, her and uh, John McCain. Uh, they were they were both there in, in Kiev whipping up uh, uh, anger and promising U.S. support for a, a, a revolution. Well, Mom, you, I'm glad you, you, you know it, too. My, my point was going to be that you know, you have these bureaucrats who who make mistakes, and the next thing you know, there's a gigantic propaganda machine saying, oh, it's the horrible Russians. You know, it's the horrible whoever. In 1914, it was the horrible Germans, or the horrible Austrians, or the horrible French, yeah, the horrible Russians. Uh, so then they have to turn around, justify what they did, and then millions of billions of uh, have to pay for it, which is a gigantic problem. Yeah, well, if your if your business model is perpetual war, then you have to keep war going, and and I think that's what we're facing is that there are there are people in this world who have a a deep financial stake in uh, perpetuating conflict. Well, yeah, certainly a financial stake and sometimes a psychological stake. And, and you're you're exactly right. I don't particularly like saying it, against, especially since we have to pay for it. You know, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize, and I think he's gotten us into more wars than most presidents in, in history. Um, let's talk about the European Union. Uh, is it going to survive in its current form? Well, I don't see how it can. I, I hope that the, uh, that the euro, uh, with, well, first let's go back. The world needs something to compete with the U.S. dollar, which is a terribly flawed currency with the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. So the euro, in theory, or something like it, would be good for the world. Unfortunately, it was badly executed. In good theory, badly executed. And now we have many problems. So I don't expect the euro, the currency of the European Union, to survive. And I don't. I doubt if the euro, European Union will survive as we know it, because since Brexit occurred, it, it has encouraged many people, many separatists in Europe, uh, who want to split up their own countries or split up the, the European Union. And I, since I expect bad financial times to come, when they're bad financial times, people always look for big change. They blame things on the foreigners. So I don't see how the, the euro itself or the European Union, as we know it, can survive. Yeah, and the Italian banks are, are very shaky right now and uh, really could... Uh bring chaos into the European Union at any time in 2017. Well, yes, the Italian banks are in trouble, but so is Deutsche Bank, which is the largest bank in Germany. There are many banks. Look at America. There are many banks in America that have huge debts now. We had a big problem in 2008 because of big, big debt worldwide. Well, now the debts are higher everywhere, Rick, not just with the Italian banks, but everywhere. And if they start going down, they're going to take down other people with them because the debts are so staggering. We've all talked about a good game since 2008 about the debt, and we're going to solve the debt problems. But in the meantime, 
every country in the world has increased its debt. And every, not every company, but many companies as well. Jim, final question. I always uh, like asking you uh, for insight in in business uh, wisdom. If, if, if you were going to summarize the basic principles that have guided your life in becoming a, a successful businessman, what would those principles be? Well, basically, uh, go where other people don't go. I try to find things that are ignored or preferably hated. If I can find something that's really disliked or hated or ignored, and it probably is very, very cheap. And if I can find something like that, it's cheap, and where there's positive change taking place, then you often have a good, a good situation. I would use Russia today as an example. You know, Russia in the last two or three years has been the most hated market in the world. Uh, it looks like things are now changing for the better. And I, I have bought Russia uh, recently and, and in the past, and it looks like maybe that's going to turn out to be okay. It's a the basic point being find something that's hated and cheap where there might be positive change coming, especially if there are good assets there or good underlying fundamentals, and you might have a very successful situation. Yeah, so don't follow the herd. That goes without saying. If you follow, you can follow the herd to see where they're going, but then you go in the opposite direction once you figure out what they're going to do. Well, one of the uh, herd mentality uh, principles is uh, that you have to diversify your your investments and your holdings. What do you think of that advice? Well, no, I'm not. Uh, that, just argue, that doesn't show you're going to do very well because you're going to have losers as well as winners. Now, it's good. You won't go bankrupt probably, uh, which is one reason people say it. But if you want to be successful, then what you need to do is focus. You need to put your eggs in one basket. But you got first of all, you got to make sure you got to Right basket, Rick. The second, you got to watch that basket very, very carefully. Don't. You're going to lose everything. You're going to go bankrupt. But if you really want to get rich, the way to get rich is to focus and be sure you're right. I have um, observed over my lifetime that great people do one thing great. And that's literally what you just said, focus. Yeah, you just figure out what you're good at and do it, especially if people laugh at you. And you're really on the right track. Yeah, that's the fun part. Yeah, you find what you love. I mean, the world is full of them. Bill Gates, you know, he got tossed out of university because he was focusing on, on something they didn't understand. So the world is full of people who uh, were laughed at, but who focused on one simple thing and did extremely well. Well, a great book for our audience, if you want more of Jim Rogers' Wisdom, A Gift to My Children, A Father's Lessons for Life and Investing. Jim Rogers, thank you. So good to hear you again. Uh, Thank you for being here uh, in the closing days of 2016. My pleasure, Rick. I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's not all for today's edition of True News. Edward Zoll is coming up after this break with two very important reports. Don't go away. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. This is Max McLean. When Jesus taught, many were amazed at his insight. But who were the first to recognize who he really was? Listen to the Bible from Mark 1. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. From Mark 1, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the end time newscast.
Welcome back to True News. I'm Dr. Burkhart sitting in for Rick Wiles. President-elect Donald Trump has fortified his West Palm Beach Resort for the Christmas season. For the latest from the Trump transition team, True News correspondent Edward Zoll has the highlights from today's press briefing. This is the December 21st Trump transition press update. We're 30 days out from the inauguration of President-elect Donald J. Trump, and the presidential inaugural committee has now released their schedule. On Tuesday, January 17th, the events will unofficially begin with several dinners to honor President-elect Trump, VP-elect Pence, and members of his administration. On Thursday, January 19th, President-elect Trump and VP-elect Pence will lay wreaths at Arlington National Cemetery. And later that day, there will be an open-air Make America Great Again welcome celebration concert at the Lincoln Memorial. On Friday, January 20th, President-elect Trump will attend the swearing-in ceremony, followed by the inaugural parade down Pennsylvania Avenue and two inaugural balls, including the Armed Forces Ball. On Saturday, January 21st, in the morning, President-elect Trump, his family, and key figures in his administration will attend the National Prayer Service held at Washington National Cathedral. RNC spokesman Sean Spicer noted that President-elect Trump has now held 100 meetings and in, with individuals to fill cabinet positions, and there are more than 300 landing team members involved in the preparation for the White House transition. Further announcements for staff appointments are expected for later today and tomorrow, including the coveted Secretary of Veteran Affairs and the Department of Agriculture. Cleveland Clinic CEO Toby Cosgrove and businessman and Vietnam veteran Luis Quinones are being reportedly considered for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Regarding today's schedule for the president-elect, Donald Trump began his day with a formal national security briefing for Pentagon and intelligence officials. Trump spokesman Jason Miller noted that the president-elect receives three formal briefings per week, but daily briefings from retired General Michael Flynn, his national security advisor. The rest of his day will be consumed by internal staff meetings regarding his schedule for the rest of the week and the Christmas weekend. Both the president-elect and vice president-elect will be spending Christmas with their families, with Donald Trump staying in West Palm Beach and Mike Pence celebrating from his home in Indiana. As for highlights from the Q&A portion of the call, Fox Business asked about Donald Trump's tweets today regarding the Electoral College and the popular vote. The president-elect tweeted the following from his official Twitter account this morning. Campaigning to win the Electoral College is much more difficult and sophisticated than the popular vote. Hillary focused on the wrong states. I would have done even better in the election, if that is possible, if the winner was based on popular vote but would campaign differently. I have not heard any of the pundits or commentators discussing the fact that I spent far less money on the win than Hillary on the loss. Trump spokesman Jason Miller responded that these tweets are nothing new and they speak for themselves. Inside Defense asked about a Pentagon memo, which was leaked to foreign policy yesterday regarding Donald Trump's defense priorities lacking specifics on Russia. The December 1st Pentagon memo released yesterday showed Donald Trump's four-point priorities list for the Department of Defense, including defeating ISIS, eliminating budget caps, developing a new cybersecurity strategy, and finding greater efficiencies as the president-elect's primary concerns. The memo was written by the Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Brian McKeon, two employees in his office. McKeon noted he received the priorities from Myra Ricardel, a former Bush administration official and a co-leader of Trump's Pentagon transition team. Trump's spokesman, Jessica Ditto, said of the memo, For the media to speculate that this list of issues represents all the president-elect's priorities is completely erroneous and misleading. Trump spokesman Jason Miller responded to the question by saying Donald Trump has not yet been sworn in and aspects of his administration are still coming together. He said that it is premature to comment on the memo, adding that the Department of Defense Trump landing team has had over 100 briefings with the DOD on budget and organization issues, and the memo was created from a brief internal conversation, the notes of which are not comprehensive policy. Jason Miller ended by saying, to read into it any further than that would be erroneous. ABC News asked about potential conflicts of interest with Trump's children holding a charity event on January 21st. Trump spokesman Jason Miller responded by referring to a statement sent to press yesterday from Hope Hicks, the national press secretary for the presidential transition team. The statement read, The opening day events and details that have been reported are merely initial concepts that have not yet been approved or pursued by the Trump family. Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump are avid outdoorsmen and supporters of conservation efforts, which align with the goals of this event. However, they are not involved in any capacity. The only other update from today are reports that Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau held his first call with President-elect Donald Trump, and they discussed easing environmental restrictions, such as those involved with the Keystone Pipeline project. Canadian PM Justin Trudeau told an audience in Calgary Wednesday regarding the call, he actually brought up Keystone XL and indicated that he was very supportive of it. I will work with the new administration when it gets sworn in. I'm confident the right decisions will be taken. The next True News Trump transition update will be tomorrow at 1130 Eastern. You can find this and more at truenews.com. That is T-R-U-N-E-W-S dot com.
Thanks, Edward, for that update. Now, during this winter season, many Christians are plagued with illness due to poor diet and weak immune systems. Has gluttony become one of Satan's primary tools to undermine the body of Christ? True News correspondent Edward Zoll recently spoke with chiropractor and biblical health counselor Eric Zielinski regarding this growing epidemic in America's churches. Here's Edward. Raised in Detroit on the standard American diet, Dr. Eric Zielinski is intimately familiar with what it is like to overcome chronic health conditions and personal adversity. Plagued by addiction, depression, gut disorders, skin conditions, and utter hopelessness, Dr. Zielinski's life was radically transformed in 2003 when he became a Christian. Immediately recognizing that healthy living was a spiritual act of worship, each of the conditions that haunted him from his youth started to fade away one by one. For the first time in his life, he found purpose for living and started to share his story and research with everyone around him. For more than 15 years, Dr. Z has devoted his life to teaching the world biblical health principles needed to experience the abundant life. Joining me by phone today to discuss the taboo subject of health and attrition inside the body of Christ is Dr. Eric Zielinski. Welcome to True News, Dr. Z. Oh, thank you so much, Edward. It is really an honor and a privilege to be on the show right now. Oh, the, the, the honor is all ours. Uh, Dr. Z, you, you probably experienced this quite a bit. Is there a lot of pushback from, uh, from Christians and evangelicals when you, you try to broach the subject of, of changing diet? Oh, dare I say, once you start stepping on people's idols, <laughs> that's when the prophets get stoned, man. That's just the bottom line. Gluttony is the acceptable sin in the church. I've been guilty of it, but you know what? I've repented. God has enlightened me to that fact. And it's about knocking down those idols one by one. And the first thing is sugar. And we could talk all about it, but boy, people worship sugar much more than they worship God when it comes down to it. And that's, it's hard. It's hard. But at the end of the day, you know, when you have that prophetic voice, when you have that prophetic calling, you have to be that voice in the wilderness. You have to be that watchman on the wall. And I'm very much encouraged by reading the Old Testament because, like Stephen said, have you not persecuted any of the prophets? Even the righteous ones you condemn. And any one of us who has a message of truth, a message to help and share people, to share with them life, we're going to get persecuted. It's just the way that it is. You're absolutely right. So your your message has been uh, to not not just for obviously for to change a diet, but for for Christians to take hold of what's given to us and and again live an abundant life. Can you can you explain that a little further? I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, and we could even prove it through what our bodies. I mean, we just prove it through science that our bodies are designed by God to heal themselves under the right conditions. The problem is throughout years of just just destruction, through years of industrial revolution, stress, sin. You know, what the Bible says in the book of Romans, man will invent new ways of evil. I believe that is a direct quote towards things like vaccines, GMOs, pesticides, that sort of thing. We've gotten to a place right now where our God-given right, and I do believe it's our God-given right to live healthy and strong, has been attacked, has been attacked by commerce, has been attacked by the pharmaceutical industry, has been attacked by big government. And it is a fight. It is really a fight to hold on to the abundant life. And to me, my, my, not my life verse, but my work verse, my professional, the, the verse that really epitomizes my professional work, my ministry, is John 10.10. 10 where Christ is so clear, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you may have life and have it to the full. And Edward, I'll tell you, I've seen nothing, nothing like sickness and disease that robs people of the abundant life. Because when you're sick, when you're tired, when you're bedridden, you're veritably useless for the kingdom of God. I mean, very much so. How many people do you know? Just basic, just look at it. Common sense wise, you're on life support. You're in a coma. You're in bed. You're not out sharing the gospel. You're not out being a blessing to people. You're barely surviving. And if someone's in that situation, my heart goes out to you. I want to help you get healthy and strong. So then you could be like the lepers to go out and share with the world what Christ did for you. But that's how I see the Satan. That's how I see the devil attacking the body of Christ is through our health. And that's why I want to help people. Focus on that, and then we could really, truly live the abundant life. What can the average Christian do right now to change their lifestyle? What are some basic steps you give some, uh, some your patients and people that come to you for advice on this subject? First and foremost is to recognize that health is a spiritual act of worship. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Everyone hears that. Everyone talks about that. It's usually in regards to 
um, sexual sin. We hear them in the pulpit talking about addiction, like smoking, maybe drinking, things like that. Tattoos. I don't know. I've heard that talk about tattoos, right? But do we really recognize what the Lord says shortly after that he says, for those people who destroy my temple, I'll destroy them. And this is what I want to share. A lot of us are committing suicide by our lifestyle habits. I've seen people literally eat themselves to death. A friend of mine, a pastor who is morbidly obese, my heart goes out to him. He is the only person I've ever known to develop emphysema because he was so overweight. Emphysema is an obstructionary pulmonary disorder that's usually caused by smoking. Well, he ate himself to respiratory disease. And I'm pleading with him. I'm pleading with my pastor friend to stop, to change his life. To, and he goes, Eric, what do we do? Christians don't drink. Christians aren't supposed to smoke. So we've got to do something. Let's eat. That's the number one thing is to recognize that it's a spiritual act of worship. And if you have fallen to going to food, sugar, chocolate, sweets, fatty, whatever it is, whatever foods that are your comfort, if you've fallen to going to these foods instead of going to God, then you have to knock down that idol in your heart. You have to cast down that idol in the name of Jesus and then repent. And God will show you the way. That's first and foremost, this conviction. Because this is not a diet. This is not a detox program. This is a way of life. And I guarantee you something, and I try to be careful about this. I guarantee you, if Christ were walking on earth today, he would not be going to the store and buying Twinkies and Ho-Hos. I promise you that. Because it's poison. And it's killing people. So first and foremost, that's it. And then, once you get through that, start to pray. And ask God, God, what should I do? And, I, and you don't can go to my website. You can go to other people's websites. There's so much information out there, health books. But first and foremost is conviction and being truly determined to make this your best life. Now, when it comes to uh, changing one's life, you know, it, Jesus said he came not just to, uh, to bring the gospel, but also to separate, uh, divide man from man, brother from brother. In this regard, you're speaking about dividing let's say, uh, uh, the average Christian in the churches in America, from, from their, their sugary snacks and their sweet, sweet uh, idols in many regards. But other than identifying this and, again, recognizing it, what is the first step a Christian who's trying to give up their unhealthy lifestyle needs to do in, in the physical aspect? Is it exercise? I mean, what, what is the core? As you said, it was sugar. Is, is, it, is it the sweeteners? Is yeah. it GMOs? What, what, can you speak to that? Yeah, to me, the, the most destructive physical agent on the market is sugar. It's sugar. It, it is something that could turn around someone's health relatively immediately. As Mark Hyman, Dr. Mark Hyman, um, the director of the, the Functional Medicine Institute at Cleveland Clinic has, has shared very eloquently, I mean, sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. And I know for certain myself, realizing sugar was a big cause of my health concerns. It could be linked to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, metabolic disorder, and everything, brain fog. It is it. And it's in everything. And so for me, if I were, if that's what I did personally, and it took years to truly get to the point where I'm at now where I just don't have sugar. I enjoy honey, maple syrup, natural sweeteners like the herbs, stevia, I love things like coconut crystals. Don't get me wrong. I mean, God gave us beautiful fruits and honeys and things for a reason. The Bible says honey is good, but the Bible also says in the book of Proverbs, don't eat too much of it or you're going to throw up. You'll vomit. It's in the book of Proverbs. So using that wisdom. And I'll tell you this. There's a lie from the pit of hell that says everything in moderation. No way, shape, and form. There needs to be total abstinence from pornography. There needs to be total abstinence from adultery. There needs to be total abstinence from murder and total abstinence from sugar because it's a destructive force. And I've heard people say, Dr. Z, well, God made sugar. No, he didn't. God made the sugar cane, which when you take it, chew on it like they do in native cultures, you gradually get a nice, you know, it's like a bell curve of a glucose rise in your blood sugar. You get a nice little energy boost. You're chewing on that cane sugar, so you're actually expelling energy. You're, you're, you're using your muscles and your jaw. It's a nice experience, but when you take that, process it, bleach it, and give yourself a little spoon full of sugar that helps the medicine go down, what's going to happen? You spike your blood sugar. 
you actually dampen your immune system for every soda pop that you drink about the four hours. Literally, you dampen your immune system by 75 to 80%. So the reason I'm mentioning this, Edward, is because people are walking around and they have, they're have they walking around with crippled immune systems and they don't even realize it. So no wonder people are dying of the flu and, and they're, you know, they're getting sick all the time because they can't even fight infection. The, the immune system that God gave them has been hampered. So that's the first thing. And it's easy. The easiest thing to do is anything that you see in your medicine cabinet or any really in your medicine cabinet or in your pantry that has the ingredients, sugar, high, fruit, um, high fructose corn syrup, maltodextrin, and some other aliases, even evaporated cane juice, which is the same thing. That's just the, that's just the sneaky way of getting more sugar. Literally throw that stuff away. I mean, if you want to go radical, that's how radical you go. If, if that's too hard for you, I understand that baby steps. Well, stop drinking soda pop. Easy, easy peasy. Stop drinking soda pop. Stop having sweets that you get at the store and start making your own. And I love soda. I used to drink, I mean, you know, I used to drink soda a lot. My natural soda right now is a little bit of sparkling water. Like I'll get a 32 ounce um, thing of Perrier, like a glass of Perrier or San Pellegrino. I'll put a drop of lemon or orange essential oil and a few drops of stevia extract. Bada boom, bada bing. I got my seven up. I got my Sprite. And it's very satisfying. And here's the thing, folks. I promise you this too, because this has been clinically proven. Your taste buds will actually change. If you've been on the standard American diet like I was, you don't even know what real food tastes like anymore because our, our taste buds have literally been fried by all the chemicals. You give yourself three to six months three to six months and watch what happens. I can't even eat that stuff anymore. I'll get sick. And also here's the other thing too. If you want to go really radical, especially now during the holidays and new year's resolutions and fun things, if you take this challenge, literally cut out all white sugar, all white flour and all white salt, do it for a month. Do it like a lot of churches call the Daniel fast, right? A lot of churches do a yearly fast where they start the year with prayer and they, they stay away from sweet bread, they call it. You do that and watch what happens. I've never seen anyone do this and not lose 10 pounds. Every single person, even myself, I'm the same guy. I did that. I lost five pounds when I first started doing this 13, 14 years ago. So if you want a challenge, if you want to do a fast, if you want to do a cleanse, that's the first thing. White sugar, white flour, white salt. That's, that's a pretty radical thing. And here's the thing. Look at your body. Notice what the changes are. Be cognizant of how you, you are responding to this. And very cautiously, re-put things back into your life, reintroduce things back into your life. And I'll say most people that I introduce this to, they don't want to go back to their old lifestyle. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up essential oils. This is an area of expertise for you, right? Can you speak a little bit about how aromatherapy might play into this, uh, this change of lifestyle? To me, there is no, no aspect of life that cannot be enhanced by aromatherapy. And it's a pretty broad statement, and I know it's a broad stroke, but I've literally spent full-time research on it for the last three years, and I'm just so convinced. Like, let's say, for example, addiction, and we're talking about sugar. Perfect, perfect example. Um, a lot of people in the body of Christ and in the world, you know, outside the church are addicted to sugar. And how do you know if you're addicted to sugar? Go without sugar for three days, 100%. Just eat fruits and vegetables. Just try it. Watch what happens. Most people have detoxifying reactions. They'll start to get the sweats. They'll start to get shakes, night sweat. They'll start to crave it. Well, clinically proven, we have seen that black pepper oil actually helps the addiction cascade. It actually helps with people that are addicted to nicotine. With, um, it helps them with their withdrawals. So they can get through that withdrawal period. And people that are addicted to sugar and other unhealthy foods have the same addiction response that other people do that are smokers, that are drug addicts. So easy thing to do, put a couple drops of black pepper in your diffuser and just diffuse that at night. Maybe you can have what people call a black pepper stick. You get a, um, a toothpick that you put right into the bottle. You suck on that, you know, just like a, not even a drop of essential oil on it. You actually suck on that too. If, if someone, especially that works very well with smokers because they like that oral fixation, but anything, you could put a drop of black pepper in your soup, but just for example, 
And there are other satiating oils that really help like peppermint, grapefruit, lemon. These are detoxifying oils, but they're also known to help curb unhealthy cravings. So many ways, Edward. And I mean, that's why I created um, uh, an extensive database on my website about how to use oils for health reasons, for spiritual purposes, because, hey, you got to remember, you know, what does the Bible say about frankincense and what does the Bible say about myrrh and about the incense that God told Moses and the priests to use? I mean, there's a, a spiritual component as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Do- Dr. Z, can you, uh, can you give our audience uh, your, your book and also your, uh, uh, your website where they might be able to find some more information on the subject? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please. Um, you can check me out online. I'm on Facebook. Uh, my website is DrEricZ.com, and that's DrEricZ.com. Just check it out, and a lot of information. I have devotionals. I have a biblical, a biblical health radio tab, um, a lot of information on, on health and essential oils and all sorts of different things. Well, Dr. Z, this has been an incredibly informative uh, block of time, and I, I really appreciate you joining us here today on True News. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming back. All right. God bless. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you, Edward, for that great information. And uh, we thank you for spending this time with True News today. God bless you so much. We appreciate you setting aside time every Monday through Friday to be with us at True News. Please tell your friends about us and help us to grow even bigger and bigger in 2017. And if possible, Put a gift in the mail this week before January 1st comes around to show your support for True News.